Well, good morning and welcome everybody to day two of the CBI's Achieving Net Zero conference. My name is Matthew Fell. I'm our Chief Policy Director and part-time MC, and I'll be guiding you through today. Uh, look, for those of you who were here yesterday, we had a, a terrific jam-packed day uh, and a few sort of highlights and takeaways for me. Uh, I, think, I think we heard, look, just what a big opportunity is facing the UK, but also with a sharp edge that every other country around the world is onto this agenda too. So we need to stay, uh, fight hard to stay front of pack. To do that, I think we also heard, look, there's just a real focus on delivery, getting things done, uh, being clear on the business models, being the best in class market maker to get some of the investments flowing. And I think we heard the importance of just keeping consumers on side, particularly through a cost of living crisis. And that will be really relevant as we head into today's agenda as well. Just in case you weren't here yesterday, uh, a recap on some of the housekeeping too. Uh, we're not expecting any fire alarms or fire drills, so if you do hear the alarm, uh, please follow the Science Museum staff guidance uh, to the nearest assembly points. Uh, please also keep your mobile phones on silent, but absolutely do engage with us uh, on social media throughout the conference in the morning. And if you have questions, uh, we're keen to make this as interactive as possible. So uh, when we come to the various sessions, if you have a question to put to the panelists, uh, raise your hands, we'll get someone to you with a number and a microphone. And when you come on in, please state your name uh, and organization before pitching your question. So on to this morning. And one of the things we heard yesterday an awful lot was just how much the terms of engagement have changed in a fairly short period of time over the last six months. And the exam question facing us in this first session, cost of net zero or cost of not zero, essentially, do we ease off in the face of a cost of living crisis or double down because this is the way through and the way to greater energy resilience? To debate that, we've got a terrific panel here this morning. Uh, Gillian Cooper uh, from Citizens Advice, Ian Fennell from Hitachi Energy, and Tim Lord, Head of Climate Change at the Phoenix Group, and to steer us through that and moderate the first session, John Foster, Director of Policy at the CBI. Would you all join me up on stage and we'll get underway. John, over to you. Well, good morning, colleagues. Absolute pleasure to be here with you this morning. Matthew, thank you for that brilliant introduction. So um, welcome to the first session of day two of the CBI's Achieving Net Zero Conference. As Matthew said, my name is John Foster. I'm the director of the CBI's policy unit and I'll be steering you through the next 50 minutes or so. Now, as you can see in the big screen, the title of this morning's session is Cost of Net Zero or Cost of Not Zero. Very clever, you see. Now, we've got about 50 minutes. So Matthew actually stole what I was gonna say. I think our exam question is slightly different. So here's the challenge for all of you. The exam question over the next 50 minutes is can we generally afford the investment necessary to deliver on our net zero objectives? So keep that all in mind. Now, I'll come to the running order in a second, but just to double down on Matthew's introduction, really grateful for our expert panelists this morning. We have to my left, Gillian Cooper, who is the head of energy policy at Citizens Advice. Ian Fennell, who is the UK and Ireland CEO of Hitachi Energy. And then last but by no means least, we have Tim Lord, who is the head of climate change policy at Phoenix Group. Thank you for being with us. Now look, in terms of the running order for today, listen, we're pretty friendly here at the CBI. It's early in the morning. I can see lots of you are already having your coffee, so I'm not gonna call on you yet. So you've got a bit of time to get the thinking caps on. Instead, I'm gonna steer us through a couple of opening questions just to get the blood flowing, but I will be coming back to you. So I wanna see those hands raised and we have some moderators in the crowd to be able to pick you out. So let's get cracking. Ian, I'm going to bowl the first ball to you, and I'm sorry it's a toughie, but a goodie. Now look, Matthew gave a really good overview of how the cost of living crisis has really shone a spotlight on the expense of the transition to net zero. So Ian, the first question to you is a tough one. Can we actually afford the investment necessary to transition to net zero? Uh, thanks, John, for, 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 for bowling that googly. Um, so, uh, you know, for me, the answer is we have to. Right? If, if, if we believe that, that, that net zero and, and climate change is going the direction it's going, then there is no option at all. 
But can I let me put this in context? Uh, you know, if you go back to, uh, I, I think, a question that Tony uh, asked yesterday uh, of, of Alec about, about is business stepping up to the plate? And my challenge, I guess, is, is government stepping up to the plate? And, and if you look at things like the supply side of, you know, of energy, uh, you know, for me, there's a big tick in the box. You know, they're doing an awful lot for you know, renewables, you know, offshore wind, uh, offshore transmission reviews, uh, the energy security, uh, you know, nuclear being part of the equation now, for, for me, always had to be part of the equation, particularly um, uh, SMRs, which, which are obviously coming on stream quickly. Whether or not the time scale is, is real, that, 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 that's another question. From a demand side point of view, you know, the scorecard for me is, is very, very low. It could be one out of 10, it could be zero out of 10. They must do better. So th there's an awful lot, I think, still to do to decarbonize the uh, demand side as opposed to the, the decarbonization of the supply side. And, and bearing in mind, of course, that, that we're, we're in this period up to 2030, we started the energy use, if you like, that has got us this far about 250 years ago at the start of the Industrial Revolution. 140 years ago, we started using electricity. And in eight years, we need, to, we need to take what we have done in the last 200 odd years and change that super tanker around. That's the challenge that we have. And, and I think there, you know, government, there's been some leadership in government, there's been some leadership in business, but I think the leadership there really involves us all as individuals and as individual leaders. And actually, I, I'm going to ask the first question of the audience. And, and this, this is not about taking out your phones and, and using a slide or anything like that. So all you have to do is put your hand up. Who here knows their personal CO2 emissions on an annual basis? Wow, handful. So, so I do, I've, I've, I've calculated it. And I think, I think one of the things is, for any of these journeys, if you don't know where you're starting from, how do you know where to get to? How do you know what action you need to take? And my challenge, I think, to us all as business leaders is to make sure that we understand that journey, that we take the personal choices and decisions that we need to make because there is a huge behavioral change that is required in order to get us to that question. Mm. That's super, Ian. So, Gillian, I'm just going to bring you in now. Ian talked about that journey, and obviously, from the citizen's advice perspective, you sort of think of yourself a little bit as kind of the consumer, the customer watchdog. Just talk us through what that transition means from a citizen's advice perspective. Sure. Um, so, for those of you who don't know, we've got st a statutory role in the energy sector, so we're both a consumer advice provider and an advocate. Um, and I think my starting point is probably the energy crisis means that net zero is more important than ever, um, but we should never downplay the challenge we're asking of the public here. The net zero transition means that people are going to have to make major changes to their homes, um, everything from installing low carbon heating, future proofing their homes to make them more energy efficient, and take up new products and services to help them use energy in a more flexible way. So that's a big ask of the public. Um, and we, I think there's probably three key challenges we want to nail if we want to convince the public around net zero and bring them along with us on that journey. Um, the first is obviously the cost of living crisis that we're in at the moment. Um, we've got a huge and growing number of households who simply can't afford the essentials. And if you can't afford the basic cost of life, you are just not in a position to think about the longer term. And that's really important. So the, the new government support package is incredibly welcome. Um, it's going to prevent the worst harm this coming winter. But we still need to be a lot more radical about how we solve the problem of high energy prices in the longer term. And that basically means coming up with credible policies to tackle the demand problem we've got with our homes and fix the poor quality housing stock that we've got in this country. Um, so what that looks like, you know, from a starting point, there needs to be a much wider range of financial support available, everything from grants to loans to green mortgages, and that needs to come forward quite quickly, I think. The second is around consumer protection. Um, the net zero transition for people is going to be about interacting with a series of different consumer markets when making changes to their homes or how they use, how they behave in their homes. Um, 
but we need we desperately need to future proof our consumer protection framework if we're moving to a world where we're doing sort of hundreds of thousands installs of new products and services in people's homes and obviously there's a big payoff with that if we get it right because we'll create sort of thousands upon thousands of highly skilled green jobs across the country if the public feels we've got this right and finally um, I think that you know the challenge we've got is decarbonizing our energy system um, I think this is an area where there is there is more clarity but there's still a lot of challenges to deal with around the sort of sequencing and timely delivery here um, and I think there's going to be a sort of ongoing need for scrutiny um, because we need to deliver the net zero infrastructure at the lowest possible cost um, so that means getting better at sort of strategic planning but also retaining the right amount of flexibility to shift tack where needed um, so net zero it's an infrastructure and a systems challenge but it's also an ask that we're putting to tens of millions of individuals and we need to be devoting a lot more time and thinking to getting those aspects right and, and I think that's just because otherwise the politics of what we're trying to achieve just simply won't work because we're not going to take the public along with us. Brilliant. Thanks, Gina. We'll come back to the politics in a second. But, Tim, I'm just going to come to you. We will pick up. So, Tim, for those of you who don't know, is also a, uh, a fellow at the Tony Blair Institute. We might come back to your recent piece of work on the, the consumer journey in a minute. But let's just stay with you for the Phoenix Group. For those of you that don't know, the UK's largest business retirement investments uh, uh, service. Just give us a little bit of a sense, Tim, when you're thinking from that perspective, what are the business and political risks to delivery when it comes to those net zero objectives that Ian spoke so articulately about at the beginning? Yeah, thanks, and uh, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to, uh, to be here. Well, I, I think that's the right question. In some ways, I don't like the name of the panel in the sense that I'm, I'm more interested in investment rather than cost, because I think this is mainly about investment. It's about a lot of investment, and that's a, that's a different framing, uh, I think, to, uh, to the cost framing. I think the first thing I'd say is about pace, because we've been talking about this for a long time. I've been working on, I worked on the climate change bill back in 2007. Many of you will have been working on climate uh, for as long or longer than me. But if you go back 28 years, we were getting about 88% of our primary energy in the UK from unabated fossil fuels. After all that time working on this problem, we're now getting about 75%. Now go forward 28 years, and we need to be getting basically zero uh, from unabated fossil fuels. So the pace that we're working at is not quick enough yet. Um, and the scale of investment we need needs to accelerate a lot. The second thing I'd say is, you know, we, have, we all go to these conferences, net zero feels like a very, very complex beast, and in, and in many respects it is. But actually, when you look at the investment, you can break it down. What do we need? We need renewables, we need nuclear, we need storage, we need networks, we need CCS, we need hydrogen, we need EVs, we need energy efficiency, we need low carbon heating, and we need a lot of trees. And a few other things around that, but basically that list is, is kind of what we need to massively scale up investment in. But if you look from, from our perspective as a, as a major pensions investor, relatively low risk investor, because people don't like us messing around too much with their pensions money, where are the relatively low risk investments? Well, renewables, we've got a really good investment model in the CFD and investment is flowing very quickly into renewables and the barriers there are not really around investment, the barriers are more around the planning system and for some renewable technologies, obviously, uh, government policy. EVs, you have a pretty good investment model because they're cheaper to run, increasingly they're cost comparable. Uh, on the forecourt and you're seeing an exponential rise in EV sales. But when we look at the other technologies I talked about, the investment models aren't really there yet. So for me, the biggest risk is that we've set a lot of targets. I think that's really important. You know, I was in government when we set the net zero target. We want 24 gigawatts of nuclear. We want 50 gigawatts of offshore wind. We want all, all of these targets, but we don't yet in many of those sectors have the models that are going to drive it. And, and to me, uh, that's the biggest risk. And that translates into political risk in the sense that if we're saying we're going for net zero but we're not getting the investment models in place, then we're going to have underinvestment. And underinvestment in energy is a very, very dangerous place to be, both economically and politically. Thanks, Tim. Now, Tim mentioned the political risks. Obviously, this is a business conference, right? But we operate against the backdrop of a highly febrile political environment. So we drew straws just before about who was going to take the first political question. Sadly, Gillian copped it. So, Gillian, this one's coming your way. <laughs> Um, we've got a cost of living crisis, which has really, as I said, shone a spotlight on the expense. But in particular, we've started to see the re-emergence of this narrative that green levies are responsible for increased household bills. So um, this is pre-watershed, but you may remember David Cameron uttering a particular phrase about getting rid of that green stuff, shall we say. It feels like it's just come back again. Um, how damaging is that potential narrative to, to the net zero objectives that we're all focused on today? Um, 
so I guess the starting point, it, it is unhelpful. Um, and I think, you know, if you look at any of the charts that Ofgem publishes about what goes into the cost of an average energy bill, it's quite clear that the, the increases are being driven by high wholesale prices, not green levies. Um, so, but then, you know, it's, it's also another truth that it is more progressive to pay for, um, pay for these policies through taxes than it is through levies. Um, so, you know, we've got two things that we have to handle there. Um, and I think, you know, whenever we've, we've done surveys, whenever other organizations have done surveys, it's been clear that consumers are willing to some degree to use public money to support the transition to net zero. So that's, that's helpful. Um, I think in the longer term, we probably need to be thinking about a pathway where sort of, you know, we're not adding new green levies to bills. Um, and if we do think about moving some existing green levies off bills, that needs to be done really carefully. Um, before the, the sort of pre-existing um, energy crisis, there was a lot of talk of shifting levies off electricity bills and putting them onto gas, which makes sense for a lot of things. If you want to sort of stimulate the, the heat pump market, for example, that, you know, that's a good way to make the cost of the heat, running a heat pump lower. But there's, there's lots of distributional impacts that we need to think through, and that needs to be done really carefully. And I think the sort of the legacy of the, the Cameron um, green crap row <laughs> was that it, you know, it did set back progress, um, particularly when it came to sort of energy efficiency installs. Um, and you know, the net result is that we are paying higher bills as a result now, because the sort of government um, took action in a somewhat knee-jerk way. Um, so I think it's just sort of, if we're gonna do it, do it thoughtfully, think it through, take account of all the distributional impacts, um, and make sure we get the right settlement for people. Brilliant, thanks, Gillian. Um, Ian, I'm going to come to you now. The sort of narratives that the one that we've just uh, discussed often emerge in an absence of sort of fact and insight. So do you, do you think that business needs to do a better job at explaining the costs of the transition? Is, should this be on us as much as it is on politicians? Uh, to be honest, I actually think it's on everybody. I think it's on politicians. I mean, it's not, it's not either or, it's both and. And I think everybody involved in this journey really needs to understand the whole picture, the end-to-end -end picture. And I think at the minute, we're just getting snippets of that. We're getting clarity in certain areas, mm -hmm. and in other areas, there's no clarity at all. And I think that, you know, the whole transition, it, let's face it, I mean, the, the, you know, the, the, the aspects of it from an investment point of view are really simple, as mm -hmm. you know, you know as Tim's, Tim's articulated. But the journey itself is going to be really, really challenging. It's a bumpy road to get to 2050. You know, the goal is worth it. But, but it's going to be extremely challenging to get there in a fair and just way. And maybe challenging, of course, maybe we can't do it in a fair and just way. Not entirely. And, and, and the decisions that we take on this journey, because, because as, again, as Tim said, the pace has got to pick up. We, we have got to get to something that is, that is you know, achievable and deliverable quickly. And, and at the minute, we are not going fast enough. So Mary Robertson was on the stage yesterday, you know, and she's, she's saying nobody has met their targets. Nobody. So, so we have to pick up the pace, you know, you know, incredibly so. And I think we have to try and describe as best we can what that journey looks like. The behavioral changes we have to make as individuals, the way that we lead either from our own organizational point of view or in society at large, we, we have to paint that whole picture. And we have to put the mechanisms in place to enable that to happen and identify those who are going to be extremely challenged as a result, and particularly those who are fuel poor, poor and, and to make sure that the appropriate mechanisms are in place to, to help them get there. And I, 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 I sit on an Innovate UK uh, advisory board, and, and when this started, this was about four years ago, and it started, and, and the board got together and there was a number of technical people and academics and then behavioral scientists around the table. And I thought, this is a really disparate bunch of people. But actually, this has been one of the most interesting projects that I've done because every impact, everything you do has got an impact on you know, the way that people actually use energy uh, and, and consume it and, and, and have a view about it. So if we don't tell that whole story, then I think people are in the dark and remain so, and therefore are concerned about what the future looks like. Mm. So paint the whole story for me, end to end. And it starts with government, business absolutely as well, uh, but you know, civil organizations, civil society at large, 
you know, communities, we, we have to get down to that level because it will impact absolutely everybody. Mm. Tim, um, Ian just made a brilliant point about the necessity of sort of painting the whole story. The story from your perspective will be one of investment and jobs. Is that enough to convince, or to Ian's point, does it actually need to take on a much more broader focus on societal impact, et cetera? Is that something that you're thinking about at the Phoenix Group? So, so I think it is, and I think, you know, it used to be that the framing around climate change was all about kind of polar bears, and we've moved in the last few years to a framing that is very much around jobs and growth um, and so on, and I think that's a really, really important part of this, and a lot of the discussion yesterday, I think, was focused on, uh, on that aspect and the fact that we need to get ahead of that um, in terms of where the UK economy needs to go. But I do think actually it's incumbent on, on business and on government and on, on all the actors that Ian was talking about to explain the benefits of this transition. So this isn't just a kind of eat your greens agenda. You know, this is an agenda which involves lower bills, warmer homes, more mm -hmm. livable communities, cleaner air, you know, jobs in growing industries rather than jobs in sectors which, which perhaps don't have you know, as big a future uh, in the low carbon economy. And I, I think that it's really, really important that we um, politically, but, but as businesses as well, that we are articulating that. I think secondly, it's really important, as Ian says, that, that we're honest about what this transition actually means. I remember working in government on advertising. We did an, a campaign that some of you might remember called the Act on CO2 campaign about how can you decarbonize your lifestyle. I mean, we used to have adverts on things like unplugging your phone charger or carrying around a bit less junk in the boot of your car to reduce your fuel consumption. And those are perfectly sensible things to do, but they're not going to transform mm. your carbon footprint. And I think there is a need for a bit more honesty around what this transition actually means for people and what people uh, actually need to do. And then the third aspect for me, which is you know, broader than just what we do, but is around how we make it easy for consumers to make these transitions. Because at the moment, we might talk more about home energy, but it's hard. So we at Phoenix, for example, we're moving one and a half million customers, about over 15 billion of assets onto um, a sustainable default fund. So that means you don't have to go onto an app and choose exactly where your pension is going to make sure it's as sustainable as you want it to be. It's about us doing that for you and delivering the same or better returns than you have before. And if we can do that more broadly for consumers, make it easy to make these choices, that's the only way that we're gonna you know, move at the kind of pace that we need to. Brilliant, thanks Tim. I remember that campaign very well. In fact, it's a bit of a sore spot at home. My wife and I constantly argue over whether or not to turn the TV off <laughs> at the mains or via the button, but anyway. Le listen, um, let's kind of fire you all up now. Um, let's get to the sort of Q&A from the audience side. Can we have a bit of a show of hands and then we've got some roving mics kicking about. I've got a gentleman at the front here. Let's take a couple so that we can move through. Anyone else want to come in? Are you all feeling very shy this morning? Uh, yeah, we've got another gentleman. And then, was that a tentative hand? No, oh, Acc an accidental hand. We've got one there, one there, and then Kate brilliantly. Thank you. So just there, Amy, just there, right in front of you. There you go. Yes, sir. Uh, just it, it, at the risk of sounding like a game show host, just tell us, uh, what's your name and where have you come from? Yeah, my name's Ivor Tucker. Um, I run a company called Hope Sustainability, which is a social enterprise around educating kids about the um, sustainability and how to be part of it. Um, I, I think it's really important all the three panelists have talked about educating the public um, because it's all very well to talk to an audience like this who are in, this, in the system and understand the issues. Um, but unless the general public understand the issues in a much deeper way than is currently the situation, um, we're not going to get to the behavior changes that we need. Um, and the interesting to, I, I think the, the, the title of the topic is the cost, and I do think the discussion about investment is also about talk, getting people to understand about the opportunity cost. So, for example, Bad decisions taken 15 years ago mean higher energy bills now. Um, bad decisions or a lack of engagement now is going to mean a lot hi higher costs down in the future. Um, so it's looking at the benefits but also the opportunity costs and trying to monetize those, those opportunity costs and getting the people to understand that I think is a big issue. So what can the business community in particular do to educate um, the general public and working through, as we do, we're trying to work with schools and linking what people are doing so that we're just talking to colleague of Ian's um, before, before we started, um, about it's really complicated to explain to kids about, for example, what the energy grid is and how it all works. So it's, it's trying to get these complex issues across to kids to understand what the scheme is, is a real challenge. And I really think that the business community needs to engage much more significantly with the education system to get these concepts across. Brilliant. Thank you. Ian, I might come to you sort of at Hitachi. What sort of thought do you give to engaging with the local communities, particularly the younger generation, to explain, I guess, A, what the business does, and then the sort of broader impact on net zero? There's, uh, thanks, uh, and th uh, that's a great question. Um, I mean, I mean there's, there's a couple of things that, 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 that we're doing at the minute. We, we, we work with a charity called Founders for Schools, which, which, is, a, which is a brilliant organization. I don't know how many have heard of it, but 
but it, it's, it was really targeted but with, with helping kids understand how business works and, and, and the benefit to the children in terms of actually getting proper jobs at the end of the day fundamentally is, 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 is just tremendous. So, so it's, it's worthwhile that investment and the more people that can sign up as ambassadors for founders for schools, the better. So, so, so helping you know, kids understand what, what business does you know, and how it operates. I mean, I think, I mean the, the, other, the other thing that springs to mind, particularly when it comes to net zero, um, Hitachi Energy have, ha, are working with an organization to look at the efficiency of heating systems in people's homes. And ourselves and a number of the other COP uh, principal partners uh, are doing exactly the same. It started with NatWest, who, who, who initially run, run a pilot. And, and, and this is to look at you know, heating system, the current efficiencies of heating systems are notoriously poor. Why? Because they're put in and installed and commissioned by people who've got no idea what they're doing. So, so around 85% of heating systems in people's homes are just poorly set up. And so the benefits of getting it right, so that, you know, a, a survey costs a couple of hundred quid, and we're supporting, you know, a number of our colleagues and, and, and say the other principal partners doing the same. Uh, you, you can get a saving, an energy saving of, of around 10 to 15%. Now, when your annual bills are as high as they currently are, it's a no-brainer to do that. Mm -hmm. Now, that, 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 doesn't, that, that, that just knocks one aspect of the whole energy efficiency thing on the head, but you might as well do it because it's a simple, uh, a simple act. It, it doesn't inter interfere with your living. You don't have to rip all the walls out and put insulation in. So it's a very, very simple thing to do. So again, you know, the, the, there are certain initial steps that we can make very simple ones, very uh, not costly at all. Yeah. I wouldn't say they're necessarily all cheap, but given where energy bills are at the moment, it is a very, very good payback regime. And Tim, the, the pensions investment business is pretty complicated as well. What sort of outreach do you do? How do you try and explain, tell your story in particular to the younger generation? So I think it's tricky because I mean, a, a lot of people don't realise that their pension is invested at all, right? Um, they don't. They don't understand. You know what happens to that money when it when it goes out of your uh, of your payslip every month. So that the first challenge we've got is about helping people to understand that more because that, that enables them to understand the impact that uh, that those investments uh, can have. So we're we're doing a lot of work around um, being able to present to people in a more straightforward way. You know where is your money? What's the carbon impact it's having? And how can you uh, how can you impact that? And some consumers love that. Some people really want. Some people like being on apps and you know moving their money around and seeing how it's performing. Uh, on a day-by-day -day basis. The one thing I'd say is that I, I think education is hugely important, but I think we need to be cautious about thinking that, you know, just by giving people loads of information, that will kind of deliver the transition. Some people don't want that. Some people just want it to be straightforward. Some people really care how their boiler works. Some people have no idea how their boiler works. Mm -hmm. But the problem at the moment is, you know, I'm looking at getting a heat pump at the moment, and I'm sort of trying to figure out what size of heat pump I need myself. And I would be the first person to say that I am not the person who should be trying to figure that out. Someone should be doing that for me, and it should be easier for me to be able to access that. So I think, again, I'd kind of go back to that point that I think, I think education is hugely important, and people's understanding of what this transition looks like and what can be impactful really matters. But I think also that not everyone, we, we don't all need to understand exactly what's going on under the bonnet for it to work and how you make it easy for consumers to take that knowledge and understanding that climate change is an issue that we need to act on and turn it into the things that actually really deliver emission reductions. Brilliant. Thank you, Tim. Kate, we're going to come to your question now. Amy, we've got another gentleman with his hand up. Anyone else? And then just a lady at the back there. Thank you. Yes, sir. Good morning. Uh, Charlie Dunn, First Choice Homes Oldham. Uh, we're a social housing provider. Uh, achieving net zero by 2050 will be a sum of many parts. Uh, in social housing, we are doing it in bite-sized chunks. We are mainly focused around EPCC by 2030. Uh, my question is, uh, do you think there are enough transitional targets in the, the various individual sectors that will contribute to the overall uh, achieving of net zero? Brilliant. Thank you, Charlie. Tim, I might come to you. you know, we were talking just before about almost that targets versus detail. So um, any thoughts from you on that particular area? And then Gillian, I'm gonna to come to you for some thoughts as well. I mean, I think, I think my short answer would be yes. I think transitional targets are really important. So yeah, we, we've got a net zero target for 2050. What I'm much more worried about and concerned about how we deliver is a 50% reduction in our emission footprint. We've got a 300 billion pound investment portfolio. We've said we're gonna halve uh, the emissions footprint of um, the vast majority of that by 2030. That I think is a much harder 
thing to do. And, that, and we need to do that. That's what the science tells us, that you know, we do all this in the 2040s and we're going to have two and a half, three degrees of warming and net zero will be costly, but we won't avoid the costs of really significant amounts of climate change. I mean, the second reason why it matters is because it sends a really clear investment signal that we need to get on with this now to people in your sector and, and many other sectors. The only thing I'd add is that I, I do think targets matter. I think they're really important. I think the, the Climate Change Act has been transformative nationally. I think company level targets um, have the potential to be transformative as well, but you have to back it with the policy to get there because otherwise you know, we're not going to hit, hit those targets. And I think in many sectors, including uh, in buildings, you know, we do have pretty ambitious targets now. We could probably augment them a bit, but really the key thing is about how do you get the investment flowing? How do you get consumers understanding what their role is? Because otherwise you know, we're just gonna go wishing past those targets. Uh, and we risk not meeting them. Super, thanks, Tim. And Gillian, just from a citizen's advice perspective, what is the detail that you're looking for that needs to almost sit underneath those targets? So I think it's the practical steps um, that people can take <laughs> along the way. Um, so that's, that's where we're missing a lot of the clarity here. Um, we do have the sort of high-level targets, but when we're thinking about sort of how we're going to go about convincing the public that they need to start taking these steps, giving them access to practical independent advice to help them understand what the best decisions are for them is going to be really key here because otherwise they're not going to be able to cut through the confusion. As Tim say, if Tim's struggling with getting a heat pump installed, what hope has a normal member of the public um, in trying to do that? So we need a huge investment in advice. I think businesses need to invest in ensuring that they're able to provide good quality advice themselves. Um, to potential customers. Um, we also obviously need a big investment in the supply chain um, and enough money for enforcement um, to ensure that we can sort of pick up any emerging problems as quickly as possible. We do a lot of work in the, the retail energy market. We've obviously had a big sort of market meltdown over the past year. We need to make sure that that doesn't happen in the sort of net zero space because otherwise we're gonna sort of choke off public in interest in it in the transition before it really gets going. Thanks, Gillian. So, Ian, we've had detail, we've had advice and enforcement. What's the missing part of the puzzle from your perspective? So, so my challenge to everybody at the beginning was, do you know where you're starting from? You know, mm -hmm. so my, my carbon footprint is just under 10 tonnes and, and I've already got a heat pump. It took me a long time to get it, but I've already got it. But I don't have an EV yet and that's my, that's my next move. So, so, so there's a number of things. It's not just about the target, it's about how you deliver it. Are you on track to meet that target? Uh, and actually yesterday, th there was a, um, a thing launched by uh, uh, VCMI, so the Voluntary Carbon Markets Integrity Initiative, which is to try and support companies who are on that journey. And there is a shed load of greenwashing out there and, and, and you see it all over the place. It's, it's, it's everybody's on the bandwagon and, and don't believe everything that you see on the adverts and you know, you know, company brochures about this, that, the next thing. There is so much greenwashing out there. And I think, I think we, we, will, we will soon wise up to the fact that we have to make sure that our shareholders, those that are investing in us and all our stakeholders have the confidence that what we say we're doing, we're actually doing. So the VCMI initiative, I think, which is, and they've, they've published yesterday, a draft code of practice. So Hitachi Energy have said, yes, we will, we will use that draft code of practice. We will give VCMI the feedback on how it's working. Is, is it good, bad, or indifferent? And that's the sort of information that, that they want. We tried to do that ourselves and thought, you know, are the projects that we're building, are they green or not? You know, define green. So, you know, it's a really, really difficult thing to get your head around. So, so I'm really pleased that, that an organization like this has actually got a code of practice in place which guides you through the steps that you need to take to meet the targets once you've set them. Brilliant. Thanks, Ian. We're going to go to uh, another question. The gentleman in the front row, and then we'll come to the lady at the back afterwards. Is, is this on? Yep. Yeah, it's on. Okay. Andrew Ryle at the Institution of um, Engineering and Technology. Um, We've talked about skills, and that came up yesterday, and there's a, a clear lack of skills or insufficient number of skills to carry out the necessary work. Um, very much linked to that is competent delivery. Um, now, does the panel think that the regulation, the policies, the structures are in place to ensure competent delivery? Because if not, and if public trust is eroded, then that could totally undermine all the, the good work that is taking place to, to reach the targets. 
Super, thanks, Andrew. Um, what a question, eh? Uh, I can see Tim's furiously uh, scribbling around. Do you fancy a first pop at that, no. Tim? <laughs> um, very happy to. I mean, I, I think it matters enormously, of course. And, you know, you've seen uh, not so much in the UK, but in some other countries where they've had major energy efficiency or low carbon heating programs that didn't have that. And, and you do experience a public backlash, um, uh, as you'd expect. I mean, I think it is really intimately linked to the skills question in the sense that you have to have the long term clarity around where a sector is going in order to enable the investment in the skills in the competent uh, delivery because the people see that as part of their long term business model. It's not something where you've got, you know, X hundred million of government funding that we've got to deliver in the next three months and then it will disappear and we go back to what we were doing before. And so, you know, I agree with you that the homes transition uh, is not the only part of this transition, but it's probably the most important sort of politically and in, in terms of public perceptions. And for me, the key is having more clarity around actually where are we trying to get to in terms of our heating systems, in terms of the required levels of energy efficiency in different homes and sending that really clear signal to the supply chain. Um, so it may, does make those investments in skills that can enable that competent delivery. Clearly, you know, and, and, and citizens advice do, do you know, great work on this and have talked about it a lot. You, you need that to be backed with really good consumer protection regulation, really good rights of recourse uh, as and when things go wrong as, as they inevitably will. But for me, it all comes back to, you know, the long term clarity around where you're trying to get to and then the policy instruments in the short term that enable you to get on that kind of upward curve. Um, of, uh, of delivery and then I think you can get to a point where you do have the skills coming into the workforce and that you do have the kind of competence of delivery uh, to make sure it happens. Brilliant Tim. Gillian I'm going to come to you sort of competence of delivery what's really needed to, to underpin it? Um, so just to build on what Tim said I, I also think we need to move away from the sort of stop start programs we've had um, with sort of the, the Green Deal, the Green Home Grant, we need to kind of move away from that. Again, just to send the right signals to business that it is worth investing in the supply chain because we do need significant investment there. Um, I think from a consumer perspective, um, one of the problems people face right now is this, you know, if you're trying to get a heat pump installed in your home, if you're trying to sort of retrofit your property, there's too many codes out there. There's multiple codes covering the same type of things. Let's rationalize that. Let's have a single mandatory code that everyone's required to be a member of and let's back that, that up with some proper money for enforcement to make sure that we're delivering the quality installs that we need in order to make sure that there's sort of ongoing public engagement with net zero because when people hear about scam artists taking advantage when people sort of hear about sort of you know their friends and relatives having poor quality experiences that is going to affect people's desire and interest in making the changes to their own homes so we just we cannot afford to get that wrong. Brilliant. Right. Uh, the big countdown clock of doom is telling me we've got 10 minutes left. So let's try and hoover up a few more questions. We've got Kate at the back. And if anyone else wants to pop their hands up. Yep, we've got a uh, lady here and then uh, Tanya, gentleman at the back. Brilliant. Uh, Caroline Morris from KCOM, which is based in the Humber region. Um, it's part of an observation rather than just a question. There's been a lot of batting stuff backwards and forwards, saying government should do this, business should do that. I actually feel really privileged in our area because we have a network of people and businesses and local authorities coming together, forming working groups, doing that engagement piece because we've, it's a sense we've realised we all are part of this journey and actually we've not heard a lot about cooperation, collaboration, engagement so that that conversation is happening. And I think as businesses we have tremendous opportunity to reach our employees with this message. And it comes back to some of what you've already said. We need to simplify that message. We need to make it accessible for people. So that this almost becomes part of the employee benefits offering that we give to people in the same way that COVID has created well-being offerings as, as part of that expectation for our employees. So I suppose my ask is, how do I help our employees sort of measure their carbon footprint? What are the tools that we can access? How can we all cooperate more fully and transparently to make this conversation happen? Because we've got to accept that we're all part of the answer to this. It's not a case of batting it backwards and forwards. We've got to work together on this to actually get to that end goal that we all have. So I suppose really my question is sort of how do we pull this together? How do we as you know, coalesce around this to make it happen rather than just ask, sort of passing the question, passing the buck backwards and forwards? Brilliant question. Great sort of rallying cry as well. Ian, I'm going to come to you because you spoke about uh, the sort of knowing your own carbon budget as well. How do you talk to... Uh, employees at Hitachi, how do you provide that support so that colleagues can go away and think about it in their own businesses? Well, I think I think there's a, a, it's a brilliant question. I, th I think I think there's there's a number of things that you can do from a, from a from a business perspective, but I think it's it's slightly broader than that. 
Uh, and I think, you know, the whole net zero piece ultimately has got to, from a demand side point of view, has got to be delivered locally. So national infrastructure projects are fine, you know, and central government can, can, can support those. But, but in terms of decarbonizing the built environment, local, local is where it has to happen. Because there's 28 million buildings out there, every single one of them has to have some intervention or the other. So I think the, the whole concept of, for example, local area energy systems, local area energy planning, and, and, and pulling together everybody at, at that locality, define local, of course, you know, but, uh, and, and, there's, and there's maybe a bit of an, uh, an, an issue. Is it, is it a region? Is it a city region? Is it a, is it a county? You know, is, it, is it a town? But I think, I think you know, ultimately, at the end of the day, that's, that's the mechanism that helps all those organizations coalesce around about a common strategy. And I, I'll go back to Innovate UK. They, they've, they've done a number of, they've sponsored at least a number of projects. One is in Oxfordshire called Project Leo, so Local Energy Oxfordshire, you know, Google it. Um, you know, so, so, there's, so there's, and there's, there's some great examples out there of where local uh, companies and communities have actually got together and started to work through the issue. And, and, and in terms of how to do it, so the Energy Systems Catapult has actually supported that project with some sort of bespoke planning tools to help local authorities get through this whole process. So the local energy plans, I think, it's easy to, uh, relatively easy, to pull together those and understand what, what they look like, the delivery of them and the incentives to make sure that everybody has got a, 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 you know, a goal to go for and the financial support to do it, and whether that financial support is short term or long term. So short term, it may be paying for heat pumps, long term, it may be something you've got to do to your property, you know, particularly in so social housing, we, we, we had that uh, uh, you know, uh, question earlier on. You know, so the local authorities and government have got to take leadership in, in that sort of area. Um, but you know, lifetime mortgages or, or, or even generational mortgages, these sorts of things, you know, are financial instruments that we have to pull together in order to support that transition. Thank you, Amy. Let's take a, a couple more questions. We've got Tanya, number five, at the back, and then Amy, I'll come to you. Hello there. I'm Craig Melton from Tech UK. We're the trade body for Tech Times. My question is around reporting. Um, how much impact do you think the new reporting initiatives are going to have on, I guess, sort of public and stakeholder expectations of services? We've got the ISSB and the Transition Pathways Task Force, which are stem from the financial world. But you've also got regulatory ones too, so TPSC in the UK, CSRD in Europe, the Americans are consulting. Um, how much impact do you think these reporting initiatives will have on sort of general understanding of climate and where companies are in relation to their uh, net zero goals? Super, thanks, Craig. Tim, I might just come to you. How important is reporting? So I, I, I think it matters enormously because kind of what you've seen in the corporate sector over the last few years is, you know, net zero wasn't even part of the conversation, right? And so I remember working in government on the 2017 election, not a single manifesto, including the Green Party manifesto, even mentioned net zero, right? And now it's kind of part of the furniture. It's, it's you know, in the law, 95% of voters in 2019 supported parties committed to net zero. And similarly in the corporate sector, we've all, we've all set these targets. A lot of people have set them without even knowing what their baseline is, which you know, always makes people a bit nervous. I think it was probably the right thing to do because of the scale of urgency. But I think having that transparency around reporting ha matters a lot. And, and I think for two reasons. One is because it makes it a boardroom issue. Um, and you know, TCFD and all, that, all those kind of things have moved this from being something that's done by a kind of you know, CSR or sustainability team that everyone kind of ignores in the business to something that, that is much more central to business strategy. The second is I think it does matter in terms of, in particular, you know, investors and shareholders and so on, having the information that they need uh, to be able to, to take judgments about, about where they want their money and to avoid, you know, you, know, you talked about greenwashing earlier, uh, to try and avoid that. I do think there's a really, really big challenge. We're, a, as I say, we're a big pensions business. We've got investments in, you know, thousands of different companies and assets across the economy. Trying to measure that is, is really, really hard. And I think the one thing I would make a plea for is that we don't sort of wait till we get our baselines absolutely perfect before we act, because a lot, a lot of this, you know, for, for, the, for the part of our portfolio that we have measured the footprint for, 90% of the emissions come from about 23% of the assets. So you know where you need to focus. You don't need to agonize too much about exactly how many megatons there are. You can just get on with it in the meantime. But I, but I do think that that tra transparent reporting 
is important and will be increasingly important. Super, thanks Tim. We've got just a couple of minutes left. Let's just try and capture two quick questions. We've got the lady here and then number three. So um, we're we'll just lady with the microphone, then Amy will finish with you. Uh, good morning, Sarah Pritchard from hey, Bureau Sarah. of Households. Um, the construction sector uh, is a significant emitter of carbon dioxide. I think we all admit and know that. But the engineers within it probably are going to form part of the solution of turning this around. As we heard yesterday, and indeed Ian was mentioning this morning, you know, things like the construction playbook, which the government has written, you know, can make a significant difference on driving us, you know, to make the right choices. But it's not being deployed fully by the government in either local or national uh, building projects at all. And that's even before we turn to the private sector and what it's doing. What do the panelists think we can do to try and get, you know, clients, be they public or private, to really make the difference and actually make decisions today uh, about what their built assets need to be in terms of net, you know, lowering carbon net zero in order to turn this round so we don't need to retrofit in 20 years' time? Thanks, sir. Ian, I'll come to you as an engineer to answer that question really quickly, and then we'll finish. With <laughs> Thanks. Uh, it's that, that, that's the question that depresses me the most, <laughs> because, um, because it is up to clients to, to define that they want a zero carbon building, you know, and then the, 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 the construction um, sector supports that. You know, for me, it makes absolutely no sense at all why any building being put up today is not zero carbon. I don't care whether it's a semi-detached house or a flat or a, you know, you know, a, a skyscraper in, 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 in the city. It makes no sense at all because, as was mentioned yesterday, the cost of retrofit is 10 times the cost of getting it right first time. So, so, so for me, policy, government policy, needs to be absolutely clear. And now, because, as, as, as Tim said earlier, pace is so important, get this right now, and that saves us a shed load in terms of cost down the line. Brilliant, thank you. Final question of this morning's session. Um, yeah, hi, it's uh, Karina from Shell in the Renewables Division. Um, I just want to pick up on that the last day and today, a lot about community local action. And I just want to get the thoughts of the panel here. And I know this gentleman's probably talked a lot about it. I still feel that there's a lack of focus on decentralized energy systems. It's always very sexy to talk about big offshore wind projects, and certainly Shell. You know, I love to work on those. But equally, I, I just don't think there's enough focus, commercially, politically, on decentralised, potentially behind the meter solutions. So, yeah, I'd just like to have some thoughts on that. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks, Karina. Great challenging question to finish on. Gillian, do you want to bring us home? Sure. Um, so we've already talked about local area energy plans, and I think they are going to be key here um, in terms of, you know, the future is local for net zero, and it's going to look very different in different communities across the country. Um, I guess the one challenge I, we see with local area energy plans at the moment is that there's a bit of a postcode lottery developing in terms of the sort of quality of the plans, in terms of how transparent they are, in terms of the, the sort of the funding that's needed. So that's something where, again, we sort of need the government to have a national framework and then allow that sort of local flexibility we need in order to sort of, you know, build and maintain public engagement, because I think, you know, it will be much easier to do that on a local level rather than sort of a national. Fantastic. Thank you, Gina. Well, unfortunately, we've run out of time. I'd uh, just like to say a big thank you to all of our audience for participating and a big thank you to our panellists for turning up today. Please show your appreciation. Thank you. John, Gillian, Ian, Tim and...